This is a continuation of our study that we began last week on the epistle of Jude. And today we want to look at verses 3 and 4 when it comes to this one chapter book. Jude evidently, as we pointed out last week, had intended to write something along the lines of what we just sang about in that last song, that which is the common salvation to all those who are members of the Lord's church. Yet a pressing need caused him to change the original reason that he intended to write this book. In uh, Jude verse 3, which probably you all know, he begins it by saying, Beloved, showing the disposition of heart that he had toward the brethren. You'll notice in the scripture reading, Paul's approach to the church at Ephesus was with that same sentiment. Beloved. And notice the determination that is set out in the words that the Spirit guided him to use. When I gave all diligence in other words he fully intended to do this he planned it he intended to put all he had into it and it had to do with writing to them writing unto you of the common salvation and I've touched upon that notice that a need that arose caused him to cancel his original purpose it was needful for me to write unto you and not teach you something you've never heard, but exhort you. That means practice what you've been taught. Put it into practice, especially here, that you should earnestly contend, not just contend, but you put all you have into it in contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. As I've said several times, other versions, especially the American Standard Version, 1901 copyright, has once for all delivered to the saints. And I like that translation better because it really gets more clearly what the Greek actually says about the finality and the completeness of the New Testament. This ought to teach us that you can have good things in mind, needful things in mind, but other things can come up that causes you to set aside those things. Now, we understand that in life. You have hurricanes down here from time to time, and you may have your planned out situation, but they cause you to alter. And it doesn't even have to be a hurricane. It can be any kind of storm. Illness arises. Accidents come up. Problems that you didn't foresee develop. And you have to then set aside everything that's wholesome and good and you plan to do and under ordinary circumstances will be the thing to do so you can take care of that which is needful for the moment. You start out on a journey and you have a flat tire. You won't go too far unless you take care of that which you didn't necessarily intend to happen. Especially if you bought new tires. So there's all sorts of things like that. And we readily recognize that in the due course of living life day by day. But there's something about the kingdom of heaven and citizens of it who really don't sometimes understand that. But here it is in the Bible. And it will mean on the day of judgment just what it means right now. And it won't change. Regarding your obligation and mine to the best of our ability to defend the very faith that from the heart we believed and obeyed when we were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. We sang a moment ago, write on our heart every word. Well, that doesn't happen by accident, does it? You have to do what's necessary to get it into your inward man, your intellect, where you can think about it. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, David said. So Jude sees then, no matter what he had intended, no matter how good those intentions were, 
no matter how much he had diligently purposed to write of the common salvation, he sees a pressing need to change his purpose. And it's revealed then in the next verse, Jude 4. For there are certain men. What about these men? Crept in unawares. Now remember, this is nothing new to the people. He's exhorting them to do what they already knew would happen concerning such men. But a, a false teacher doesn't appear in the congregation on Lord's Day morning for the first time carrying a banner that says, I'm here to destroy the faith of every one of you and lead you away from the gospel of Christ. Yet to see some people, you would think that uh, that's the only way that the false teacher is ever going to appear so you can identify him. And yet we know what the Bible says about Satan. We know he's our adversary. We know he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We know that's every second of every day of every week of every year. We know that he works through his agents. Who are they? Men. People. The Lord has his agents, faithful members of the church. No way can the gospel be preached except that the Lord's body does it as God intended. Amazing how God in his infinite wisdom wants everybody to be saved. Gives us time for people, Second Peter, uh, Peter 3, 9, to learn of the truth. Yet he's placed that truth in earthen vessels, the church. And he cannot get done what he wants done unless we do it. Same way with Satan. Satan works through people who are in disobedience to God, who are set to do as they please. Paul gave us a description of those as he wrote to Timothy. And he makes it very clear, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that some shall depart from the faith. What is it that we are to contend for? The faith. What did Paul tell Timothy even while he was writing, as Jude was, part of the New Testament? That some would depart from the faith. They would depart from this. Maybe they had the same caliber men in mind. So the Spirit speaks, He speaks words, He speaks expressly or plainly that some shall depart from the faith. How did they do it? Well, first of all, they couldn't leave something they hadn't believed and obeyed. So they're leaving. Depart from the faith by giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, there wasn't any little demon set on their shoulder and say, now, Here's the false doctrine I want you to believe. What it means is they have listened to the agents of Satan. That's all it means. Who are they? Men. What does he say here? Certain men crept in unaware. You weren't aware of them. Question. Was Ananias and Sapphira by their conduct agents of Satan? Would the church have really ever known anything much about them if divine intervention hadn't taken place and the apostle Peter dealt with them as the spirit guided them, I doubt it. They may have been very prominent members of the church, but they lied to God and it was over money. So false teachers creep in unaware. We're unaware of them. And notice you were warned about this. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation? Well, you mean they didn't have any choice? No. It's because they made those choices that led them away from the truth to be what they are. And if you read again in 1 Timothy 4, you'll see how that the truth meant nothing to those people once they departed because their conscience was seared as with a hot iron. It didn't bother them to do what they did as long as they got what they wanted. They're ungodly men, and what do they do? Well, they teach doctrines that turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness even to the point of denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, Jude verse 4. Well, let's develop this further. I emphasize again, they crept in unnoticed. You ever read anything in the New Testament that says your responsibility, one of them, to remain faithful to God is to watch, to be careful. 
first of all, beginning in your own mind and life and then in the lives of your brethren and everybody else, watch. Well, that's what we have to do. And consider all of this happened despite the many, many warnings given by the prophets of old and especially Jesus, Paul, Peter, the other apostles. And you see that there was a determination in the beginning to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2, verse 42. Well, if that was the case 2,000 years ago, even while the New Testament was being written, the miraculous gifts were in the church, the apostles walked this earth, then we must realize how much easier is this to happen today when we're so far removed from their very presence. That is, if it could take place in their presence, then how much more so today? So Jude's admonition to contend earnestly for the faith becomes more relevant and pressing regarding New Testament Christians' responsibility today. I think sometimes we think, well, we're talking about atheists. We're talking about those who deny the inspiration of the Scriptures, those who deny the deity of Christ. Well, yes, it covers that. But he mentioned none of those things specifically here. He just said they've turned the grace of God and lasciviousness. How they did it, we don't know all of that. We can read through the New Testament and see how these things were done. We'll touch on this a little more later. We're going to look then at uh, how some of these things took place. And we'll start by noticing the need. You know, we don't know the need of things spiritually unless you know your book. The church will always, listen to me, the church will always be interested in things that the world doesn't care a thing in the world about, doesn't place any importance on, and doesn't care one way or the other about it, and thinks you're silly for spinning your wheels as they view it to do that. You have to understand the truth and why you're here, and that life's a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And that you're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and God will take care of you, basically what it said in Matthew 6, 33. And thus you're mindful of the work of each citizen in the kingdom. There are those, of course, who deny the all-sufficiency of the scriptures as the final revelation of God to man. Notice again, they're to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. The expression is interesting as you further develop it. The expression once for all may be rendered correctly from the Greek and the English one time for all time. That's what's meant. So the expression of faith then is a synecdoche, which is a grammatical term. Grammarians use it to say a part of of a thing stands for the whole thing or sometimes the whole thing standing for a part. Belief is so important to the Christian faith that the Holy Spirit uses faith or belief to stand for the whole New Testament system. So he was saying you're to contend earnestly for the whole thing and every component part of it. So one doesn't just have to deny the Bible is not the word of God before you take care of the matter. We're talking about a body of doctrine that is the New Testament, the New Covenant. What does that say to me about the Book of Mormon among the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, or as Brother Keeble called them, the two late-day saints? What does it say about the teaching arm of the Roman Catholic Church, the magisterium, that says that the Pope and his councils can continue when they speak in the place of the apostles, give us out doctrine that may differ completely from what the New Testament says. What does that say about people who think the Holy Spirit is operating on them directly and they can actually talk to God and he talked to them just like I'm talking to you or you would talk to me and give them guidance and direct it. The Holy Spirit told me to do this or whatever. And on and on you could go 
with all sorts of ways that the devil has of getting you away from the written word where the final authority of Christ is manifest and there's not going to be any more revelation. Paul informed the elders of the church at Ephesus that he had not shunned to proclaim unto them all or the whole counsel of God, Acts 20 and verse 7. So you see it was being declared before it was ever written down. Peter wrote that God has given us all things, mark the all, all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3. So if we have all things that pertain to life and godliness, and we have the whole counsel of God, and of course we do, what is the need for further revelation? Of course from God. Thus, the scriptures that reveal the faith once for all contains all we need. It's complete within itself to become what God wants us to be. And thus, you have written James 1.25. The perfect or complete law of liberty. And the admonition there is that we continue in it. And if you do, you'll be blessed in your deed. So when people teach that God's revelation is incomplete or is a continuing revelation, Jude 3 refutes that along with other passages of Scripture. And so what are we to do when people declare that kind of thing? Well, what did Jude say? We're to earnestly contend for that completed doctrine that is the New Testament and there's not going to be any more. We're to contend for it. It's the final revelation of God to man. I said earlier that some of these teachers that he was dealing with had perverted the grace of God. The doctrine about God's favor that no man can marry or no man can earn whereby he saves us. Notice that in Jude's day there were some who turned the grace of our Lord God into lasciviousness. We don't use that word lascivious very much anymore. Licentiousness or lewdness. Licentiousness or lewdness. When you have people standing up and saying, God is God and Christ is the Savior, the Bible is the Word of God, but homosexuality is fully approved of God, what do you think? Does that sound like turning the grace of God into lasciviousness? Well, if it doesn't, what would it take to turn it into lasciviousness other than that corrupted, false, immoral doctrine? So these people had taught that God's grace, somewhere or another, gave them the excuse to sin, so much so that they engaged in that which was openly shameful, licentious, lasciviousness, or lewd. And they're saying, we're all right. Paul exposed that error in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Obviously, you had that problem. Maybe it was because of the many hundreds of years that the Gentiles, according to Romans 1, had desired not to retain God in their knowledge, and God gave them over to do all these wicked things. Now the gospel of Christ preached to them, and they're trying to come out of it, but they don't understand all these things. You say, well, we're not in that boat today. You go talk to the average person on the street, especially the younger people, and you see what you get if you don't get outright militant opposition to trying to say it's wrong. How far do you think we would get with the Spring Church of Christ if we announced publicly that we're going to have a series of meetings on the sin of homosexuality and published it throughout Houston. Much later than we think. Now, if you want to get publicity, <laughs> we can certainly do that. But individually, what's going to happen if you start teaching the truth on that wherever you are? We don't realize it, but already we're on guard. Already the thought police work in our minds and we're mindful of saying, I don't know whether I want to say that here or not. 
And therefore, there's being cultivated in us. They say, well, let's let that slide. I know of one elder in the place years ago who didn't want to put anything on the signs about the sin of homosexuality for fear that they would be exposed by the public. And so I know that the preacher did it anyway, and somebody tried to burn the sign down in front of the church building. How far are we from being persecuted for righteousness' sake? You say, oh, we're a long way. You say the thing that ought to be said so that everybody knows exactly where you stand, and you become militantly yourself opposed to it and contending earnestly for the faith, and you see what persecution will rise up. So we need to sometimes check ourselves to see if we're that faithful as we ought to be. Remember, Jude said, I am exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. You already know the truth, now put it into practice. There's some today then who pervert the grace of God. It's been going on in the denominations for a long time. Salvation by grace only. That's a perversion of the grace of God. One is not saved by grace only. Any more than one is saved by belief only. In fact, anything that corrupts the full teaching in any form of the gospel of Christ is perverting the grace of God. To excuse their disregard for the commands found in God's word, to justify their lifestyle that is contrary to the principles of the Bible, they will say things like, well, God's just too loving. His grace is just too wonderful to in any way condemn us. But we're so sincere in what we're doing. So that's been around a long time in denominational teaching. doesn't make any difference what you believe, just so you're sincere in it. But how much more so now in moral matters? Well, in that day and time, the whole empire was full of all kinds of immorality that was a regular part of their everyday life, even as this society and culture comes more in that way every day. But those who contend earnestly for the faith will be ever mindful of what the grace of God truly teaches and Paul reminded the young preacher Timothy in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, that the grace of God hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that's what you're to oppose, not let it have any influence over you and your thinking and actions. Then here's something positive to do. As you oppose ungodliness and worldly lust in all of its forms, then you're to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We did not have a choice in the time on this earth or the place on this earth that we would live. But we do have a choice as to how we use that time as we live. So how all these things take place is another story as to the specific doctrine somebody may teach that will set aside the truth of God and turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. But I assure you that it's there and will we be able to stand the fight? Or are we even willing to fight like it ought to be? There are those then who deny God's authority They've been doing that. That ties into the first when it comes to the inspiration of the Scriptures and the finality of the Scriptures. So Jude had to deal with those who deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It seems to me in reading this that Jude is giving emphasis to the term Lord. Many times Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, as Paul likes to write it, is used and the proper ascriptions of praise and honor and glory and majesty is given to him. But notice they're denying the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people today that say, oh, Jesus Christ was a great and good man, but he wasn't God. 
There are others who just do not understand, for whatever reason, that he has all authority in heaven and on earth, and that authority is manifest in his will in the words of the New Testament. This word Lord is derived from kurios. And it's in the family of words to where you have kurios, which is supremacy. So what is he saying when he says, Lord Jesus Christ? He and he alone is the one who has supreme authority. God, the Father, the first person of the Godhead, has delegated that to him. Jesus said himself, all power or authority hath been given. Somebody had to give it. Given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. So these people were denying the authority rightly belonging to God and Jesus. And this was affecting the Lord's church. Have we had anything like that? Yes, one of my teachers that I value highly, and he wasn't wrong in every point that he ever taught, was Dr. James D. Bales at Harding. But he taught the doctrine that all those who were not Christians, who were outside of Christ, who were not citizens of the kingdom of heaven, were not amenable to the authority of Christ. And he did it by saying, that's the case with those who are married, divorced, remarried, for, me, for reasons other than Matthew chapter 19. 9. But he was still denying the authority of Christ as being the supreme final authority that all men must submit to in order to be saved. And that forced him to say then, well then if men outside of Christ are not amenable to the authority of Christ, how do they become sinners since sin is a transgression of the law? But they're not under the law of Christ. So he came up with the idea of a great moral law that he never could explain in all the writing that he did. He never could. In fact, I know of a situation to where a fellow actually had a book printed, about that thick, hardback and so forth, and it was entitled The Moral Law. And when he got in the pulpit, he said, I found it. I found the book that reveals the moral law that Brother Bale says men outside of Christ are under. And he opened it up, and every page is blank. You say, well, atheists aren't going to respect the authority of Jesus Christ. It's not a matter of what they do. God expects them to. God expects everybody on this earth who's accountable to him in the United States, where this is the first day of the week, to be gathered together worshiping him right now. And you say, well, they couldn't. They're atheists. He expects them to qualify themselves by believing in God, believing in Christ, repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Christ, being baptized into Christ, living faithful every day for Christ. And when they do that, they will gather, as the Bible teaches, with saints who are like-minded and worship God on the first day of the week. They're going to give an account someday because they adopted a position that ruled all that out in their lives. This life in the flesh on earth is for one purpose for men to find God and serve Him and prepare for eternity. In our time, we often see people denying then the authority of God, as I've given you one example. Many people give lip service to the authority of God, but in works they deny Him. Long, long time have the Protestant denominations and the Roman Catholic Church, as well as the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Coptic Church of Egypt, which is part of the old Eastern Orthodox Church, had all kinds of synods and conventions and councils and conferences, all designed to work out, here's what you've got to believe to be acceptable to God. So you've had popes develop and you've had archbishops and bishops and denominational pastors on down the line, all designed to say, this is the person that tells you what to do, and if you do it, you will be pleasing to God. And that's the way it always works. It's a simple thing to understand. To get you away from God 
is all that Satan wants to do. And in order to do that, he gets you away from the authority of God and his son, Jesus Christ, as manifested in the New Testament of Christ. But those who contend earnestly for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, recognize the authority which belongs only to Christ. Matthew 28, 18. And as Paul said the same thing in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. They recognize the authority that is delegated to the ambassadors of the court of heaven, the apostles of Christ, as the early church did in Acts 2, verse 42. And they submitted to it, continued steadfastly in it. The pressing need to contend earnestly for the faith is always present, whether it's in your individual life, in your family, around your neighbors, the congregation of which you are a member, or the church universal. For there are always those who, as there were in Jude's day, who deny the all-sufficiency of God's word, who pervert the doctrine of God's grace in some way or the other, and who deny the authority of God through Jesus Christ in the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. So, how do they do this? Well, you know already we've touched on some of this. The vivid expression, a Greek word, ep agonizomai coming from agonia and you hear in our English there agony and that's what's translated contend earnestly so wh how much should you put into it to defend any one component part of the faith or all of it even to the point of pain who's the prime example among mortals just read the list of what Paul went through to do that. So this term is associated with strife and combat of the most vigorous and determined variety. That statement right there will be denied by many people who have been caught up in the romantic false doctrine concept of love. Sweet, syrupy, sentimentalism that has no connection whatsoever with the love of 1 Corinthians 13. The present tense of the verb, remember the Greek present tense, means it starts and doesn't stop. And that's what this is here. It's a continuous struggle in the Christian's life. It's a part of take up your cross daily and follow me. I don't know what members of the church thinks that means. Maybe they think it means wearing a little cross around their neck. But if we lived in the first century, that cross would mean one of the most ignoble, shameful, and painful, horrible deaths that you could undergo. And Jesus says, for everyone who will be faithful, you have a cross to bear. It certainly is different from the health and wealth gospel that's preached around by everybody. Jude believed that the foundational tenets of the Christian faith was under attack. And nothing but a vigorous opposition to whatever that error may be would be sufficient. And that every member of the church is a soldier of the cross. Do you ever think of yourself in that way? Do you ever think of yourself as a soldier in the army of the Lord? Besides the time we sing a little song with the kids sometimes in Bible school. So the use of such an expression therefore suggests the matter is extremely serious. We are at war. I think maybe it would help us when you look at the state of this nation right now to understand what we're to be doing and what may come very well upon our shoulders or at least upon our children's shoulders before very long. But I think now specifically of the kingdom of heaven and members in particular, citizens, and their citizen soldiery in contending for the faith, once we're all the saints, what that demands of you. 
we uh, have you noticed how we are? Are we big around here about getting license to carry? If we had to pass tests before we could get the license to carry this, the sword of the Spirit would be, would be the, that equally concerned. Because you can have all sorts of firearms and none of them are going to stop the devil. Not a one of them. Resist the devil and he will, if ands or buts about it, flee from you. That means you have to know how to use that sword. Paul describes the nature of our warfare in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having a ready in a and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Then Paul to the church at Ephesus, chapter six, ten through thirteen. Here's my responsibility: put on the whole armor of God. I can help you as you will to put on the armor of God, as you can help me. But I can't put it on for you when you don't want it. And you can't put it on me when you don't want it. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able, why? To stand against the wiles of the devil. Well, what's so important about that? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We can understand that when applied to carnal things, but seemingly we have a problem when it comes to the unseen, the spiritual. There is no time that Christians should be unprepared. So we must engage in the necessary training that we may vigorously contend for the faith. And we must do it even to the point of sacrifice and agony on our part. We must use the weapons that are available to us. They're listed in Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. Be girded with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, watching with all prayer. And we're to do all of this, and I'll have to sum it all up, even while we're trying to be kind to people. Our kindness ceases to be kindness and becomes cowardness when and we think that our kindness will not let us tell people the truth or about their lives. Kindness to people when you seek their soul salvation, when they're so ignorant they don't even know to be seeking their soul salvation. And when you point these things out to them, obviously Paul had some of that problem, even with members of the church, when he said, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So these things are ever before us. We're taught in Galatians 6, 1, through several verses, of course, there, about the importance of being spiritual. Spiritual simply means to do the Lord's will above and beyond all things. There's no other way to be spiritual except to do what God tells you. That's a spiritual person. It's that simple. Who's a faithful person, a spiritual person? Who's a spiritual person, a faithful person? Well, how does faith come? By the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So if you're spiritual, it's because you do what God tells you and the way God tells you and for the reason or if there's more than one reason He tells you and even when if it's authorized. And we must be willing to understand that those who really do champion evil and are true servants of Satan, when they are exposed, they don't automatically run. Many of them will stand up and fight and try to disrupt the peace that the gospel of peace brings to faithful Christians. So as we close the lesson, how vigorously, beginning in our own minds and lives and families, how vigorously do we oppose error? 
Well, being faithful means that we do. If you're not a Christian today, there's the place to begin to believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins and confess your faith in Him and be buried with your Lord in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life, a member of the Lord's church. And to be determined to study that Bible and to live it and to contend for it and every component part of it. If you're a child of God and you have slipped in not seeing really the importance of these matters, maybe even find yourself an attitude opposed to them or those who will do what Jude 3 teaches, you need to repent of that as you would telling a lie. You would using vulgar language. Or if you were a thief. That will judge us on the last day just like all the rest of the Bible as to what we did with our lives. So you need to repent of any sin as a child of God. Confess it. We'll pray with you and for you. And God's glad to forgive. He wants to forgive. Are you subject to the invitation of Christ? If so, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.